Welcome to Hot Chips 2023. Keynote 2. Hardware for Deep Learning. Uh, Bill has worked uh, across the stack, um, very pro prolific and, and uh, successful, accomplished research scientist. He has uh, contributed seminal works on parallel computing, architecture, networks, interconnects, routing, uh, so the whole stack. Uh, he has received pretty much all the awards we can get as computer architects, such as Maurice Wilkes and Eckert Mockley. He is a fellow of ACM and IEEE and is advising the US president. So um, I think we've all witnessed the tremendous impact Bill had, especially in the last year with ChatGPT, these technologies that would not have been able or possible without Bill's work. And uh, he's also a great example for technology transfer. He basically took the work on streaming processors he did with his students at Stanford and within 15 years turned it into the sixth most valuable company in the world. So without further ado, uh, Bill, please take the podium. Thank you. Is this mic working? So assume, uh, yeah, the mic seems to be working. So um, there probably isn't a person in the audience who hasn't spent the better part of a weekend playing with chat GPT, asking it questions, asking it to write stories for their kids, um, things like that. Um, so when I had to give this talk, I sat down and I typed into chat GPT, um, you know, tell me about deep learning hardware. And it said a bunch of really stupid stuff about GPUs and TPUs and stuff. And I realized that it's, it's chat GPT is all about getting the right prompt. So then I wrote the prompt, what would Bill Daly say about deep learning hardware? Actually, the prompt is here. What would Bill Daly say about directions in deep learning hardware? And it actually came up with a pretty good outline. So I was, I was very impressed. Uh, and, and if you think about what you know, what chat GPT is doing, I actually was explaining to it, do you send it a little while about how large language models work? They just predict the next word, but they predict the next word in a really accurate way. And in doing so, what they do is a process of distillation. And, and being from the hills of East Tennessee, I'm very familiar with distillation. We take a lot of corn and, and stuff, we put it in here, and whiskey comes out there. Now, now in this case, you know, what we do is we put just raw data, huge amounts um, of data, to typically a, a tree and words or more, um, you know, broken up in, into you know, tokens, which is usually about two tokens per word. Um, and we, you know, we train a, uh, a, uh, a um, oops, uh, back up here, we, we train a, uh, here's the laser, we, we train a uh, general model. And this is like, you know, taking your kid and sending them to get a liberal arts degree. It sort of knows a little bit about everything because it's been trained on this huge corpus of everything you could scrape off the internet. Some stuff you'd probably rather not have it know about, which may lead to some unfortunate answers coming out. But really to make these models valuable, we then fine tune them on special data for a particular application, whether it's coding, giving medical advice, you know, education, you know, writing, whatever the application is. And then this model becomes much better at this particular task. Um, and, and again, what we're doing here is we're distilling this data so that finally when we do the inference, we do a query and we get something out. So there are a bunch of players in this ecosystem. I'm going to focus today on you know, the hardware side, these green boxes for training, fine tuning, and inference. Um, but very critical here is data vendors, and I think the law is going to settle out on this, that people own their copyrights. And if you train a model on you know, copyrighted images, and you need to pay something to those people whose copyrights you have used for a commercial venture, and this is still settling out. Um, so whether it's you know, images for diffusion models or, or pieces of copyrighted text for, for language models, I think the data vendors are going to be a very important part of this. And of course, to the end service providers, so actually understand the customers and their needs, and they tailor these large language models and, and uh, provide the inference service that actually solves somebody's entire problem. Let's, let's go back to the beginning here and, and you know, talk about sort of this uh, you know, revolution in, in deep learning that we're all a part of. Um, you know, a lot of people sort of refer to the AlexNet um, you know, moment as the ignition of this. There are actually many examples of deep learning being applied to important problems before AlexNet. But AlexNet is a nice um, illustrative point because it shows the three aspects of deep learning. To, to make deep learning work, you need three things. And I think of them as like air, fuel, and spark. 
Um, you need algorithms, but most of these algorithms were around since the 1980s. Deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and training them with backpropagation, stochastic gradient descent were all known in the 80s. Um, next thing you need is lots of data, and for some applications it, it has to be labeled, and others unlabeled data is fine. But large labeled data sets of images, for, for example, were available by you know, easily 2005 with Pascal and then later ImageNet. Um, but progress wasn't really able to be made until you had the third ingredient, which is hardware that is fast enough to train a reasonable sized model on a reasonable sized data set in a reasonable amount of time. For AlexNet, it was two weeks on two um, you know, Fermi generation GPUs, uh, GTX 580s. Um, since then, um, the, the increase has been phenomenal. And as people have built larger models and trained them on more data, they've gotten better accuracy, better results. And so they wanted to build even larger models and train them on more data. So if you go back to AlexNet and, and you use units of petaflop days, I realize that's a really awful unit, but it's uh, the one that was easy to get a hold of. Um, you know, AlexNet was about you know, 0.01 petaflops days to train. That was two weeks on, on two GTX 580s. Um, a lot of the details of G GPT-4 haven't been published, but there have been some things circulating around on the web. And with the best information that we have, um, this is 10 to the 6th petaflop days. So it's been an increase in 10 to the 8th of the compute power required to train one of these uh, models. Um, by the way, uh, 10 to the 6th uh, petaflop days is a zettaflop day, um, you know, you know 1,000 exaflop days. Um, so, so the increase, and actually the increase in just the last few years, I think as, as Jeff Dean said in his keynote yesterday, this is going up at an order of magnitude per year for these large language models. And this has basically been um, really uh, setting the pace for us in the hardware industry because we feel like we have to provide for this demand. People want every, ever more computing power to train these larger models. So how have we done this so far? Um, here, here's a nice plot. Um, when I was at MIT, I consulted for DEC, and they uh, had this rule that you weren't actually allowed to show a plot like my last one, which had a log access on it, to anybody above the rank of vice president, because they couldn't understand it. Um, but um, so, so you would show them charts like this with a linear scale. Um, this is with a linear scale, you know, progress in, in you know, deep learning. Uh, inference performance, 1,000x in, in 10 years, something we refer to as Wong's Law, um, the, from the, the uh, Kepler generation, which is really the, 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 the first GPU of this deep learning era, although when we designed Kepler, we weren't thinking about deep learning. We were thinking about um, graphics and high-performance computing, so the best number representation it had was FP32. As we started to think about deep learning, we realized we didn't need that much precision. We could go to FP16, um, later to INT8 and FP8, um, and as we did this, as we put the um, specialized instructions in, we wound up going from about four um, teraops to about uh, you know, four, four petaflops. Uh, peta -ops. Um, now let's look at where the performance comes from for um, this deep learning. By, by and large, um, by the way, when you think about Wong's law and you compare it to Moore's law, Moore's law is all about process technology. For Wong's law of this thousand X over the last decade, um, my assessment is about 2.5 X of that is due to process technology. Because you really don't get very much more out of, out of each generation of process. Uh, the process nodes here are color coded, by the way. Black is 28 down to purple is five nanometers for, for Hopper. But going from 28 to five, we, we got maybe 2.5 5x on, on this, this performance. By and large, the biggest gain was from better number representation. Um, we started out with FP32, oops, we started out with FP32 um, over here with Kepler and moving down to FP8 with Hopper, you, you reduce the width of the number by um, by four, but multiplies dominate and the cost of the multiply um, goes as a square, so that's a 16x in, in energy per op. Um, the next thing we did is we realized that even um, you know, doing uh, very, very simple pipelines like we have in the GP where we don't do branch prediction, we don't do speculation, still the overhead of fetching and decoding instructions is many times that of doing a simple arithmetic operation, particularly when you get down to FP8. So we had to do complex instructions to amortize the overhead of, um, of that fetch and decode. And so, you know, starting with dot product in Pascal and then moving on to the matrix multiply instructions, half precision and integer uh, matrix multiply instructions in, in Volta and, and subsequent generations, we basically amortized out the overhead of this instruction fetch and decode to the point that it didn't matter. So we could be as efficient as a dedicated accelerator, but with all the programmability of, of the GPU and its rich library that has come from, you know, you know uh, since 2006, what is that, you know, 17 years of CUDA. Um, 
And then, um, so that was about 12 and a half X, getting rid of the uh, um, instruction overhead. Process is two and a half. And then the jump here, um, you know, from, um, you know, uh, Turing to Ampere is, is in large part due to introducing structured sparsity. Um, I should point out that this is the hardware gain of a single GPU and there are two other things that are very important. The first one is that the model efficiency has improved a lot as well. We've gotten a thousand X out of single GPU hardware. We've gotten at least a couple orders of magnitude out of more efficient models. Uh, so for, the, for a given task um, the gain has been far more than, than a thousand X. And then we've also, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, um, started using more than one GPU. Even, even the original AlexNet used two. Now to train these large language models, it's not un unusual to have many tens of thousands of GPUs um, training a single model. Um, so I mentioned um, using specialized instructions to amortize overhead. When, when the biggest instruction we had did two operations, HFMA, um, you did a multiply and you did an add, um, and the cost of fetching and decoding the instruction was 20 times as much as, as doing those operations. When we amortized out to doing a dot product, so we're doing eight operations now for a four, four element dot product, it's not only five times the overhead, but by the time we were doing the large matrix multiplies, doing the four by four FP16 multiply, in uh, Volta and the eight by eight FP or into eight multiply in, in uh, Turing, we're down down to you know twenty two and sixteen percent. So it's basically negligible. And by the way, even dedicated accelerators have overhead. Um, so where we are today is with Hopper. Um, this is uh, a very popular part. I think you have to wait about six months for one. Um, it's a petaflops of. of um, TF32 performance, but actually what really matters most for training a lot of these large language models is the two petaflops, the, the black is as dense, the green is sparse, two petaflops of FP8 um, uh, dense, and for doing large language model inference, it's the four petaflops of sparse FP8. So you think of this as you know, four petaflops, 900 gigabytes per second of uh, I.O. bandwidth, uh, 3.4 terabytes per second of memory bandwidth at 700 watts. Um, that's a basic building block. Now, when we train these large language models, we exploit parallelism across many axes. Um, for a long time, we tried to do what's um, called data parallelism, because it's the easy way to exploit parallelism. That's the axis into the screen here. And what you do there is you just run a whole copy of the model um, on each GPU, and you give them a different piece of, of the batch of the data set you're doing, and then they basically exchange their gradient updates so they all see the gradient updates from each other and then you go on to the next batch. That's the easiest way to do it. It's not necessarily the most efficient way, um, but people tend to go for easy first and efficient later. Um, if you think about a model like um, GPT-4, it doesn't fit on one GPU, right? It's, a, it's you know, over a trillion parameters. Um, it takes about 20 GPUs to hold a copy, one copy of the model. So we have to break the model up, and, and the, the two axes here are collectively model parallelism. We tend to break the model up in two ways. First, what we do is we take the individual matrices in the model. If you're doing the, the you know, you know, KQ and V elements into these matrices, you take the matrix that you're going to multiply, and you basically split it um, horizontally and vertically um, and put the different sub-matrices on different GPUs. That's this axis. And then we take the different pipeline stages as we have these feed-forward models. We put them on different GPUs. And so doing this combination, it's not unusual to have easily 10, 20, 30,000 GPUs training a single model. And this is the other way that we've met this sort of you know, 10 to the 8th increase in demand that I showed in an earlier slide. The first level of exploiting this parallelism is, is in our um, DGX server. This is eight GPUs, you see them here on, on the board, and four NV switches. Um, and you can think of this um, because on the NV link domain, you can do loads and stores over the network. This is like one big GPU, but with a bandwidth taper. So it's very NUMA as you get off of the individual GPUs and have to access each other's memories. Um, you can think of it as 32 petaflops of sparse FP8 um, at a little over 10 kilowatts, 900 gigabytes per second. The bandwidth coming out the back panel of this is actually about the same as the bandwidth coming out of one GPU. So there's another taper at that level. And we take those same NV switches and we put them in a pizza box. Um, so that you can extend this NVLink domain um, and um, I won't go into all of the details there. So that the result is you can build, you know, I, I think that actually, uh, um, you know, Mark in, in the talk, uh, the lightning talk about the uh, um, optical interconnect had a better picture of this. You can build large servers um, and these servers at, in the NVLink scale can be up to 250, 256 GPUs that look like one big GPU, and especially for the model parallelism, that's very convenient to be able to just load and store um, to each other's memory. And then you can scale um, out beyond that 
by um, combining these with our uh, Mellanox director switches as shown in the middle here um, to build you know, systems up to many tens of thousands of, of GPUs. Um, now, anybody can build a matrix multiplier. Um, I think if I assigned it to a graduate student, I'd expect it back in at most a couple of days. Um, what makes um, these things useful for deep learning is software. And so um, I kicked off the first deep learning software project at MV Research in, in around 2010. It was actually a collaboration with Andrew Wayne here at Stanford to port his cat finding thing that he originally did at Google um, from CPUs where it took 16,000 CPUs to GPUs where we did it on, on 48 GPUs. Um, and, uh, and that, that led to a piece of software called QDNN, which is actually now a very, very big part of the N NVIDIA AI stack. But you know, over the years, and so that was in 2010, so we've been working on this for 13 years, we built up a huge corpus of software, um, you know, both at this bottom layer of making the gems work really fast, uh, making sure that we can stage the data so it's in the right place at the right time, and you're not you know, waiting, we can fuse layers together where important. Um, and then all the way up to end applications, whether it's in our self-driving car, the drive platform, um, whether it's for um, dialogue systems as in, in Nemo, um, you know, teleconferencing, you know, Maxine, various medical applications in Clara, um, modulus for, for doing simulations based on AI. And so we built this huge software stack and tuned it so that it works extremely well. And, and one way to think about this software is it's another source of, of advantage. Um, this, these are the MLPerf um, you know, benchmarks, I think from 2.1, which is actually one generation back. I think they're on three now. Um, but I, I wanted to pull this one up because at this one we were just announcing the hopper numbers, but we showed both the hopper numbers, which are the big green bars, and then we showed the new um, um, Ampere numbers. And what you see is that Ampere got two and a half times faster, same hardware, um, over the period of time from one generation of ML perf to another. So the, the software is hugely important in getting the, the, the performance out. Um, so there, there's um, you know, many companies trying to do deep learning hardware, um, whether it's data center uh, companies that have their own um, special um, ASICs or, or whether it's um, one of the you know, 100 startups or so doing it. Um, so I like to see how things get sorted out by tracking how the ML perf benchmarks work. And if you look, I, I, and I think HPC Wire has pretty good coverage of it. So I show here the last four sets of headlines from this June, this April, and last November and April. And um, you know, basically, you know, you know, our numbers top every category. Um, a few people do show up, you know, Intel is now showing up, Qualcomm shows up, um, but very few of these many startups who claim to have really great AI solutions show up there. And I think this is really the test of whether you just have a matrix multiplier or whether you have the software that makes that matrix multiplier useful. Um, so where are we going from here? Um, one way to answer this question is to look at where the power goes um, in um, one of our latest experiments. So this is the pie chart um, from a chip I'll show you a little bit later, which is a, uh, a deep learning accelerator chip we did as a prototype in NVIDIA Research um, that, that achieves just about 100 teraops per watt on, on language models. And um, what you see is that by far most of the power still goes into arithmetic. This is you know, data path plus math. This is basically doing math. Um, the, uh, the next big chunk of the power is in memory. So this is you know, the weight buffer, the accumulator collector, the accumulation buffer. Um, this is um, RAM. And then the 6% here is communication. Um, so this gives you some guidance about where we want to look to do better. Um, so first of all, so much is going into math. We're not done with number representation. We can still do a better job at figuring out how to get the same accuracy out of the model with fewer bits by being more clever about how we use those bits to represent numbers. Um, and so I'll talk about some of these things a little bit later. Um, we're not done with sparsity either. The two to one hit with Ampere was a really big hit. I've been working on sparsity since uh, Song Han and I wrote a paper that was in NeurIPS in 2015, um, sort of rediscovering re it because there were papers on sparsity and going back to the 1980s. Um, but you know, it's kind of been forgotten and people hadn't looked at it in a while, but it turns out you, you, most of the weights in, in the neural network aren't needed and most of the activations are zero or can be made zero. And so you can get, get a lot by doing less uh, by exploiting more sparsity. The two to one is a good first step, uh, but we can do more. Um, 
We need to reduce the communication by doing the better tiling, thinking about how to stage the data so we can get more reuse out of different levels of the hierarchy, how to structure the hierarchy differently. Um, there's a lot of room for circuits. I mean, there's a lot of memory energy here. Can we design our memories to use less energy? We're still doing most of our communication on chip, doing full swing signaling. We've written you know, papers in ISSCC showing how to do a lot better than that by using you know, reduced swing signaling, especially for longer distances. And again, we'll get a little bit out of process, but not very much. Um, so let's move forward and talk about number representation. So, you know, when you take your basic, you know, digital design course, um, you get introduced to, you know, how to represent typically integers and floating point numbers, right? Um, and you, know, you have a sign and a magnitude, and for, inter for floating point, you just add to that an exponent. Um, and you compare these, if you're thinking about building a deep learning accelerator, by, you know, how much error do you have, you know, how accurate is it, um, and, and the dynamic range you have. That's the two elements of accuracy. How big a range can I represent um, and how much error? And in fact, that's really one number, right? Divide those two. Um, the, the error, you know, the, the maximum error divided by the dynamic range is really a figure of merit because you can scale any dynamic range to fit any number system. And then it's really that error over the, over the dynamic range that matters. Um, and then the cost has really has two components to it. Um, the operation energy, which is what does it cost to do the math on this number representation and the movement energy. And the movement energy is just proportional to the number of bits. When you're storing it in the RAM or you're moving it around over wires, you don't care whether that's you know floating point or integer or log um, or some symbol representation. Um, and so uh, we can compare some of these number systems on, on this graph over here. Um, and so you know, if you look at integer, you don't have very much dynamic range and you have a really big error. The yellow error, the, the uh, um, excuse me, the, the red error bar is the one that really matters here. You have a really big error compared to, to these other ones. If you use more bits, you get more dynamic range and, and less error, which is good. Um, I put the spike up here because I, I keep getting you know, these calls from these people who claim to be doing neuromorphic computing. There's something magical about it because it's the way that the brain works, but it's really more like trying to build an airplane by putting feathers on it and flapping the wings. Um, and and it, what, one example of that is um, that if you look at the spike representation and you want to try to match the uh, dynamic range um, of int 8, um, you'll wind up burning a whole lot more power uh, because you now you know, have to, on average, toggle 128 times to signal you know, one 8-bit integer. Um, and the error is basically going to be essentially identical to, to int 8, but at, at perhaps um, you know, 32 times the power. Because on average, on an int 8, you will toggle 2 bits. Um, so actually, excuse me, 64 times the power. Um, so uh, this is interesting. This is what happens when I move my slide to somebody else's laptop. Um, so uh, you have to I have to tell you what was on the slide before they moved it over. So this is the Mac to PC thing. Um, so there are two um, humps here that are sort of you know normal like distributions, uh, and this was um, a, a figure from a paper that um, Song Han and I wrote in in 2015, um, where we uh, did an accelerator chip, and we used a symbol representation. So we used a uh, um, a four-bit symbol representation and then decoded it into 16 bits. And again, if you go back, remember there's operation energy and um, communication energy. We found that we could get the same accuracy with four-bit symbols that we could from six-bit um, integers because we could put um, the, uh, the symbols where they did the most good. So if you have four bits, you get 16 points you can sample. And if you do it uniformly as you would with integer, you get the X's here, right? So you're spending a lot of symbols out here. Remember, my, my distribution is here where you can't see it. You're putting a lot of symbols out here where there's not much happening. You're wasting you know, uh, representation there. Um, and not very many here under the dense part of the distribution. And the, uh, um, th this, in this paper, we showed that you could learn, actually, the optimum um, codebook for the symbols because you can apply backpropagation to anything. So you, we applied backpropagation to these code books. Um, and we're putting the, you know, the same 16 um, points, but we're putting them where they do a lot of good and, and get substantially more accuracy. So you would need 64 points to get the same accuracy as we get with 16 here. Um, fortunately, this, this curve showed up. Um, and uh, this shows that if, you know, by the way, the, the reason why this one had the two um, the bimodal distribution is because it was a prune network. When you have a prune network, there are no values around zero. Those have all been pruned to zero. Then the other values sort of form into these two, two normal shaped um, lobes. Um, if you don't prune the network, you tend to get distributions more like this. Um, and, and the real point I, I want to make here is that 
Um, everything is centered around zero. Most of the weights are really small. So having accuracy on small numbers is super important. And then there are tails, right? The tails go out here a ways. And, and both of these will, will end up being important for the subsequent discussion. So it turns out one of the best ways to represent numbers is the log representation. And some of us, when we started out in school, um, calculators were excessively expensive and only the rich people could have calculators. So the rest of us had slide rules. Um, and slide rules are a log representation. The spacing on this is logarithmic. So you can simply put you know, the one against um, some number here and then read down and you're basically multiplying those two numbers but right? you can read off the scale. Um, and so log numbers have a lot of nice representations. So they typically have, they think of the log eight representation. By the way, when you have a log representation, just like with floating point, you can trade off dynamic range um, against um, accuracy by moving um, a, a, a division. And in floating point, it's the division between the exponent and the mantissa. In log, it's the division between the integer part of the exponent and the fraction part of the exponent. And in fact, the integer part of the exponent is exactly like an exponent in a floating point number. It decides how far to shift the number. The difference is in floating point, the mantissa is just the number you're shifting. In the log representation, um, the fractional part of the exponent is an exponent of a you know, uh, fractional power of two. So if you have three bits here, it's two to the one eighth. So it's going to be two to the you know, two to the EF over eight, whatever that you know, value from one to seven is that, that you're going to then be shifting by the integer component. Um, and uh, if you compare this to integer, um, so, so for eight bit, the worst case accuracy here is four percent. Dynamic range is ten to the fifth. Um, compared to inter integer, the dynamic range is three times, uh, three orders of magnitude better, and the worst case accuracy is eight times better. Um, why is it? So you can see this by looking at what I call the value graph of the number system. And here we basically have the actual value um, along the um, x-axis and the closest representable value along the y-axis. And what you see is with log, when you have small numbers, you have small errors. Um, and the, the max error is 9% because the first jump here is to, you know, from 1 to, um, to 1.18. Um, and um, so, so the worst case error is halfway between that jump um, and that winds up giving you a 9% error. But it turns out that at every one of these jumps, the worst case error is 9%. It's 9% everywhere. And that's the great thing about log is it gives you an error that is sort of constant over the range of, of the number system. Where with integer, the magnitude of the error, not the percentage of it, is constant over the number system. So your first jump here is from one to two, right? And the worst case error then is at, you know, um, at 1.15 and the error is 0.5 out of 1.15 or so it's a third. Um, and a lot of people say, well, yeah, that's, that's great. You're a lot better than integer. How does it compare to float? So the way to think about it is that float is log where you're cheating on that fraction part rather than representing the fraction part um, as a you know, fractional um, exponent. You're representing the fractional part as an integer, right? So it's sort of a hybrid of those last two graphs. You'll have in, in the, in the four bit F22, you'll have four wiggles of exactly the same magnitude and then four wiggles of the next magnitude and then four of the next one up. And so this is better than the integer representation because at least these four are smaller than these four. Um, but it's not as good as the floating point because the first one of these four is as big as the last one of these four. They're each 0.25, right? So you're jumping from one to 1.25 and that error is 12.5, which I've rounded to 13% here. Whereas here it's from one to 1.18 um, and the error is 9%. So you can't get quite as good, but it's close. Um, so um, when, when you're in the log number system, one thing that's really, the, the, so one motivation to use log numbers is that it's actually, um, you know, aside from symbol, a really good representation because it tends to concentrate these numbers um, near zero where most of your numbers are and where, where you want the error to be small. Uh, but the other reason is it can make your math a lot cheaper. So remember, multiplies are expensive and they, and they grow quadratically with length of numbers. But in the log system, multiplies are cheap. They're just an add. You add two logs together and that is the result of multiplying the two numbers you're representing. Um, and the problem comes that then you have to do ads. Um, and the traditional way of doing ads in the log number system is you use a lookup table to convert back to integer. You do the add and integer and then you, you use a lookup table again to convert back to log. And that's expensive. The good news is think about what you do in deep learning. You do a whole lot of multiplies um, and then you basically have to sum the results together. You do big dot products. And so if you do this right, you can basically amortize out the hard part of that log um, so that you only have to do it once um, per sum. Um, and 
Um, this is a figure out of the uh, patent application on this, where basically what you do is you take the exponent part of the um, log number system and the fraction part, and you use the fraction part to steer the exponent part so that you do different partial sum uh, accumulators of just the exponent part. So you're basically shifting one some amount of bits and then summing it into, say I, I have a three bit uh, fraction, or I have eight accumulators in. And the eight accumulators are the ones where the fraction is zero. So it's you know, just the, ex the uh, integer part of the exponent one. So it's this integer part of the exponent times uh, two to the one eighth you know, two to the one quarter, two to the three eighths, and so on. Each of those go into a different accumulator, and then you do this multiplication by that constant once after doing 10,000 adds, it amortizes that to nothing, and then finally add those up um, in the integer form and convert back to log. Now, um, whether you use logs or whether you use floating point, um, you, you want to you know, put your numbers where, where they do the most good. I, I'd probably do an aside here and, and t tell you why symbol isn't the right way to do it. So, you know, we built the, um, efficient inference engine in 2015 um, using the symbol representation and it is in fact optimal for the data storage and data movement part because it's representing with fewer bits uh, it, it's a you know if you if you train an optimal symbol table it will basically be the fewest bits to give a given level of accuracy the problem is then you have to convert it to a high enough precision uh, to do the math that you're accurately representing those symbols so it winds up making the operation energy horribly expensive which cancels out all the gains you got from reducing the data movement and storage energy, which is kind of a bummer. Um, so um, the first thing in, in, in using these number systems, whether it's log or integer or floating point, is to pick the range right. Um, so remember that, that um, you know, actual distribution I showed you a while back. Here's the cartoon version of that. Um, so most of the values are around zero. Um, there's very few of them bigger than 0.2 or smaller than 0.2, but the outliers go all the way out to plus or minus 0.8. And the conventional way of scaling this range of numbers would be to pick a scale factor um, for your number system so that the number system can re represent from minus 0.8 to 0.8. Well, it turns out that's not the right way to do it. You're actually much better off um, because then if you do that, you'll have a large amount of quantization noise. The gaps between here are the quantization noise. And, and remember, if you do that, you're now really only putting four, four representable symbols on the part of this um, curve that has any real support. Um, a much better way of doing this is to say, you know, these outliers, we're just going to clip them. We're going to make them saturate to our largest representable value, which say will be 0.2 and minus 0.2. And by doing this, we're going to introduce clipping noise on those outliers. But we're going to trade that clipping noise for reduced quantization noise because the space between these is really small. And now we're laying lots of symbols down over the important part of this curve. Um, and so you can actually formalize this. If you think that what you're trying to optimize is mean squared error, which actually correlates extremely well with accuracy in these neural networks, you can write down in closed form what this integral is based on the uh, scale factor. It turns out that's hard to evaluate in real time. And remember, for activations, we have to do this um, on the fly because we're scaling them every step. It's a dynamic problem. But it turns out there's an iterative solution with one, one pass over the activations will do remarkably well. Um, and what you can see here is as I move the scale factor down, let's just take a look at weight layer 17 here, um, from doing um, no clipping, basically I've got relatively high MSE and it's all quantization error. As I move down to, to clip by a significant amount, I mean that's more than a two to X number, um, it's actually almost three to X, um, I'm basically getting um, clipping noise as I clip these outliers to the largest representable number, but, but I'm reducing my quantization noise enough that it wins until this point. And then the quantization noise starts going up um, as, as I you know, clip down to representing nothing. Everything is squished around zero. But it's really easy to find this optimum point, and it gives you almost a bit more precision um, if, you, if you do that. So the first thing to, rep rep to do is to do optimal clipping per layer. The next thing to do, realize, is that maybe we don't want to do that per layer. Maybe we want to do that per vector. So the conventional way of scaling a neural network is you compute an optimal scaling factor for each layer of the network. Um, if you do that, you have a really big distribution to deal with. Let me actually just move on to the next slide. You have a really big distribution to deal with. Um, 
like this, and so you get a lot of quantization noise. But if instead I decide I'm going to spend one scale factor on every vector of, say, 64 elements, so I'm doing a matrix multiply of this matrix times that matrix, I'm going to take this 64 elements and this 64 elements. Now my sort of sub-distribution is smaller, um, and so even before I apply the optimum clipping to it, I can get smaller quantization noise. And again, I get like another bit of precision, effectively, um, by doing this. Um, so the, the other way we're trying to get more efficiency is via sparsity. So this is a figure from the, from the paper that um, Song and I actually wrote the paper in 2014. It was in NeurIPS in, in 2015. Um, and this is sort of before pruning and after pruning. And what we showed is that for, um, and it depends on, on the neural network, but for um, uh, multilayer perceptrons, you could typically prune 90% of the weights out. That means you leave 10% of them and lose no accuracy. And for convolutional networks, you can typically prune out somewhere between half and two thirds of the weights um, and lose no accuracy. So this is a huge win. And so since that point in time, I've been doing numerous projects trying to actually convert this to real value. And it's remarkably hard because especially when you're operating on four bit values or eight bit values, any irregularity just kills you. If you spend a lot of time manipulating pointers to figure out where the zero are and where they aren't, um, you're dead. Now, in, in um, the numerical world, there's sort of a, a wisdom that um, you shouldn't use the sparse matrix package until your density falls below 0.1%. Now that's because doing it in software is horribly expensive. But in the efficient inference engine, we showed we could get pretty good efficiency um, at around 50% uh, density because we, we basically had dedicated hardware to do the walking of the comp compressed sparse column structure. But it, it destroys a lot of regularity. That, that was comparing it against scalar computations. It destroys a lot of regularity that allows you to do very efficient vector computations. Um, so the, the thing that finally cracked this, and, and I got a couple of references here, you can look at the A100 um, white paper um, or this archive uh, paper, was realizing that if you force the, the um, sparsity to be very structured, in, in, in this case, uh, the two out of four, so out of every four weights, um, you basically force two of them uh, to be uh, zero, take the two smallest ones, just force them to zero, and then you actually retrain that. Um, you can now represent this with half the values, and then a little index that says which ones they are. You use the index to select which of the input activations um, you want to multiply those by, and now it's essentially a dense multiply, and you get sort of the efficiency of the regularity um, that, that comes with dense matrices, but you get this uh, two to one. So we're not done with sparsity. Two to one is great, but there's some matrices that are more sparse than that, and so we'd like to have other formats. We're also only applying this to the weight side right now. The activations are coming in dense. We're just selecting out the ones we want. We can get additional sparsity by, by sparsifying the activation. If you use a ReLU activation function, anything that was negative turns to zero. And you don't have to do those multiplies, but now it makes it a more dynamic problem. And it's hard not to have the overhead of, of figuring out which ones are zero. Um, swamp the, the, uh, the savings you would have by doing that. Um, so one way at NVIDIA, we experiment with different number formats and, and different um, ways of doing arithmetic and clipping and things like that is by building accelerators. Um, this is sort of a uh, you know, mugshot gallery of some accelerators we've built over the years. Um, the efficient inference engine I, I talked about where we had these sparse matrices and special um, memories to hold the pointer structure so we could walk the pointer structure with um, no overhead. Um, Joel Elmer, Joel, Joel Elmer uh, who's joint between NVIDIA and MIT and Vivian C did IRIS, which really experimented with a lot of ways of, of staging the data and, and minimizing communication, um, things like row stationary and column stationary um, and output stationary uh, formats. One of our first attempts at sparsity, actually I shouldn't say first because this was a sparse one as well, but it's maybe about three or four along the way, was this accelerated we did called SCNN for sparse convolutional neural networks, where our approach was to just multiply every weight by every activation because they're eventually going to multiply by each other at some point anyway. So we'd pull the weights out of, of a weight memory and we pull the activations out of an activation memory, multiply everybody by everybody, and then figure out um, which output activations those should sum into and do a basically an operation called scatter add at the output. The problem is that the cost of that scatter add swamped anything you saved here. Um, and uh, symbol was a nice thing to show scalability on, on a multi-chip module. Um, so if you think about you know, what these accelerators do, um, and, and this is something we think about a lot so we can get the advantage of accelerators in a programmable engine, they specialize data types and operations, right? By going to a precision and a representation um, that is exactly what you want. And then for operations, do, doing an operation like matrix multiply all at once. We can amortize out the, the overhead. And we get big efficiency gains here. Um, 
they typically have massive parallelism, and I'm talking about having thousands of units, not, you know, 16 is not massive parallelism. Um, they typically have optimized small memories so we can, you know, avoid the memory bandwidth bottleneck. And, and we amortize overhead out. Um, and, and often we'll have to change the algorithm. Sometimes we'll start with an algorithm, we'll try to accelerate it with an accelerator, um, and we'll find out we get a factor of two because that algorithm was really optimized to run on a CPU. And it turns out when you build the accelerator, what was expensive on the CPU is now cheap and vice versa. Um, so I've been doing this for a while. I've been building uh, fast accelerators since 1985. Uh, when I started with simulation accelerators. And a lot of these lessons generalize into, into the deep learning um, domain. Um, probably the biggest one is that CPUs are really awful at doing things um, where you have adequate parallelism because um, they have all sorts of mechanisms optimized to give you good single thread performance. Now I sat through the CPU talks yesterday. Yeah, we do all this stuff to predict where the next branch is gonna go. Um, I, I kind of liken this to a big corporation. Say you have a corporation with 10,000 employees that make shoes. It turns out there's one guy in the basement who's actually making shoes, or they may even shop it out to some, some shop in Asia. Um, but um, there's a, a guy figuring out what order to make the shoes in, and you know what color people would prefer and stuff like that. This is like the branch predictor and and you know check, checking for misspeculation and seeing if you can advance a load ahead of a store, or something like that. Are the are the addresses going to conflict? So if you uh, go to this paper that came out in 2015 with a relatively modest out of order ARM core, an A15, um, and you look at that a 16 bit integer add which takes 32 femtojoules, um, the overhead is. Um, about 10,000 X, right? So this is area proportional. That's how much area, that's how much energy the ad takes. The blue is all the stuff of figuring out, you know, that you got the right registers and your branch didn't go the wrong way and stuff like that. Um, so you can't afford that. The other thing you have to do is be really wary of the cost of operations um, when you build an accelerator. Um, and you'll see that the cost of math goes up quadratically, that multiplies at least um, with length. So you're going from eight bit to 32 bit um, multiply is, is not, you know, um, 4x, it's uh, 16x. Um, and um, you also realize that just reading a memory is pretty expensive compared to doing um, anything. So if I just read a, a even just a small eight kilobyte memory, um, you know, that's, you know, five picojoules, that's more than a 32-bit floating point add. Um, so going going to and from memory is, is super expensive. Um, the, uh, the thing you also need to realize when you're reading a big memory, that big memory is made up of a bunch of 8K byte memories, and everything else is, is communication energy, which is about you know 100, 100, um, 100 femtojoules per bit millimeter, um, and and um, that sort of real. real pushes this reality that you really need to stay local if you want to be efficient. And the world is, is non-uniform. Um, you, know, you can try to you know, make your model such that everything appears uniform. That just makes everything equally expensive as the worst thing. Um, so reading in, you know, a local SRAM is five picojoules per word. Getting it from somewhere else on a reasonable sized chip is about 10 times that. Um, and remember, the reading the RAM was still five picojoules. The other 45 picojoules was getting your address to that RAM and getting the data back to where you wanted to use it. Um, and then if you have to go off chip, things are pretty bad. Um, the uh, LPDDRs are, are about the most efficient um, uh, memories out there. They're actually about the same energy per bit, around five picojoules as um, eight, um, uh, HBM. <coughs> So um, one of the more recent um, things we did is we actually uh, wrote a system to find optimum accelerators because there are a lot of design choices in, in uh, um, designing deep learning accelerators. You, you can have you know, different widths of the vector units. Um, you can have different sizes of the weight and input buffers and different levels of, of the memory hierarchy. Um, and you can then also tile it differently. So we co-optimized the tiling, the ordering of the loops and how we you know, split the loops to stage data down the memory hierarchy, um, along with sizing the buffers and picking the vector length and such like that. Um, and by picking the optimum one, um, this was in 2019, we published this. This, this on, on sort of 8-bit math hit about you know, 20 teraflops per watt, um, which is you know, um, you know, sort of twice what we're doing now on, uh, on Hopper. Um, but more recently, we decided to push this a little bit further, and this is um, a paper that was in the VLSI Symposium last year. This is the, the JSSC version of it referenced down here. Um, and we used Magnet, which is that um, um, program we wrote to optimize deep learning accelerators, and we used it to optimize it for transformers, for, for large language models. And um, we, we had a multi-level data flow, so we're staging the, the data through a number of levels of memories to minimize 
um, the, the data movement and memory energy. And so the last level of, of these, what we called you know, um, collectors, which is sort of a, um, a reuse of a term that we use to refer to a level of storage in the SM, um, uh, was very small and there's very, very low storage energy then feeding the math units. And we actually um, used a very low precision data format. We used int4, but by applying the two tricks I told you about previously, the quantization, optimum quantization, so, so that we're basically clipping um, to trade off our clipping noise against quantization noise and um, scaling so that we actually were um, applying the quantization uh, factor to vectors and we could vary the vector length. I think we actually went up with 32 as being optimum. We we're able to get essentially no loss of accuracy with int4 inference um, on these transformer models where people would normally be using int8 or fp8. Um, and in doing so, we wound up essentially hitting 100 teraops per watt, it's like 96 or something like that. Um, you know, but by doing a combination of scaling the supply voltage down um, using optimal number of formats. And there were some special function units in here. Um, there's some parts of the deep learning um, pipeline that if you don't have a unit to do it, it winds up taking a lot of time and a lot of energy. So it's worth building special function units for those. Um, so let me wrap up. Um, so it's a really fun time to be you know, a computer engineer. Um, because we're sort of the engine that's enabling this huge revolution going on right now in AI. And I think we, we really haven't appreciated quite um, how big a revolution this is. It's going to affect every aspect um, of our lives. And, and I think that the, the real race is on the application side to see how we can apply this to medicine, how we can apply this to education, how we can apply this to being more productive chip designers by having you know, our, our large language models write the Verilog. We just tell them what to do. Um, and um, you know, the, the, the progress has been enormous, but um, it's been enabled by hardware, that sort of AlexNet moment where um, you know, the fact that we finally had hardware that was fast enough to train these models on reasonable sized data sets in a reasonable amount of time. And since that point in time, eight orders of magnitude of petaflop days needed for training later, um, it's gated by, by deep learning hardware. We really um, have ambitions that go beyond what we're able to train on you know even you know a, you know, a thirty thousand node system, um, you know in in you know a month's time, and 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 these days we're taking months to train some of these models, um, not not two weeks, um, and so we feel a great deal of pressure to continue, you know the, the this this thousand x per single node that if you combine with scaling up to thousands of nodes and more efficient models is actually probably more than a million x. Um, well, it was 10 to the 8th x in, in petaflop days. We, we feel great pressure to continue the scaling so that people can see, you know, what is the next great capability we're going to get? We can build models that are 10 times larger and train them yet on 10 times more data, which, by the way, takes more than 100 times more time because it typically requires more epics as well. Um, we've gotten 1,000 x on just a single GPU in the last 10 years. And this comes from a number of factors, the biggest one of which is just efficient number representation. I remember at ISCA, I think it may have been in, in 2017, the first TPU paper was out, and they concluded they had this huge advantage. Of course, they compared to Kepler. Everybody compares to Kepler because it's an easy target, right? And everybody used to compare to the VAX for the same reason. Um, and um, everybody, everybody compares to Kepler, and, and they said, oh, we're, we're obviously so much faster and more efficient than Kepler because we're an accelerator and it's programmable. No. Um, they were faster and more efficient than Kepler. Almost the entire advantage could be attributed to the 8x difference between the FP32 that Kepler was doing and the int8 that the TPU v1 um, was doing. So number representation is huge. That's where most of this comes from. Um, and once you have the small number representations, the overhead, you know, the overhead which was large to begin with of fetch, decode, operand, fetch, and, and store um, becomes larger because the arithmetic part got smaller. And so now you need to do complex operations. So doing, doing single arithmetic operations, the whole risk mantra is a bad idea. The overhead's too large. You need to come up with complex operations like matrix multiply that amortize that overhead out and that are specialized um, for for the application at hand. Um, going forward, there, there are a bunch of things that, that, that we can do. Um, um, the first is I think we're not done with number representation. I think we can still, you know, you know we're down to four bits, right? Um, and getting no loss of accuracy in large language models, but I think we can go beyond that. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot of, of you, know, you can do sub-bit representations with things like arithmetic coding, but I, I don't think we're going there. But I think that there's, a, there's another you know, turn of the crank on number representation. I, I'm very optimistic about log numbers, and I think with optimum clipping and, and scaling per, per vector, we can do very, very exciting things. Um, I don't think we're done with sparsity either. I think you know, we have two to one sparsity on weights. We need to do something with activations, and I think we can have even much denser, um, I should say, sparser sparsity um, on, on the weight side. Um, 
I think, you know, I, I talked to you a little bit about some of our accelerators, especially the uh, this one we called Magnetic Burp, since we uh, built it for large language models. Um, these are a great way for us to really validate it works because it's too easy to do kind of a, a paper and pencil study or even a Verilog simulation study. And until you actually build the chip um, and, and demonstrate it, it running, you don't know what your real um, energy is going to be and what real accuracy you're going to get on, on uh, especially these big models that may be too, um, too large to run in, uh, in simulation. Um, so with that, I'm actually a couple minutes ahead of schedule, so uh, I'd be happy to turn it over to questions. Okay, please line up, uh, state your name and affiliation. However, like always, we start with Slack. Okay, Bill. This question was actually posed by Manu Gulati from Qualcomm, but it was seconded, third, fifth, fifteenth by people all over the place. I think the problem is, is that a lot of people are not ML experts, so there's a lot of questions about sparsity. So here we go. Here's the question. One theme that repeats in every hardware discussion about AI is the large amount of sparsity in almost all models. Why are the models created with so much unnecessary information? You spend a lot of energy training those parameters up, front and then you discard them so i think there's just confusion out there in general if you can yeah so it, it's it's not intentional right so uh so, so people come up with let me, let me go back to this when we we did our first initial work on sparsity it was like 2013 2014 and um here at stanford and um you know it wasn't like we were you know training these parameters with this intent to throw them away we took the best um models at the time, and I think at, the, at that time it was like for image recognition, it was VGG. And so we took VGGNet and we, we asked the question, you know, we, we, we were doing things like looking at the distribution of weights. We were playing games trying to figure out you know, what precision we could reduce the weights to without accuracy getting lost. And one thing we noticed is a lot of the weights were really small, right? We, first thing we did is we plotted those you know, plots of, of weight distributions. And, and we just asked ourselves the question, well, you know, if they're really small, nobody would notice if they were actually zero, right? And, and so we actually set a bunch of them to zero, and the accuracy went down. So then we said, well, maybe if we retrain the network holding them at zero, um, the other weights would learn to compensate for them. And that, in fact, worked. In fact, when we first tried it, the accuracy went up. It was better than the original model because it turns out this is actually a great regularization tool. You could have gotten that accuracy at the original model, but you would have to have done some other regularization method. Um, so you know, to, to answer the question, it's not that it was intentional uh, that, that those weights were there, but if you think about it, these um, and especially you know, with um, with fully connected layers like the last layers of EGGNet or any multi-layer perceptron, um, the uh, it, it's a it's a huge matrix, right? It, you, you've got you know an enormous number of parameters. I think the last layer of EGGNet was like 4K by 4K, so you have 16 million parameters. It's over-parameterized. It's more parameters than you need to represent the imp the information that that layer really needs to represent to learn the nonlinear function um, that that it's trying to do, and so. Um, I think it's a way of sort of figuring out what the, nat the natural information capacity of these layers is and then kind of, you know, by, by forcing that sparsity, compressing the layers down to that information capacity. Thank you. Phil? Uh, Phil Levis, uh, Stanford at Google. So uh, you talked about sparsity in 50%. How far can we go? How far do we want to go? Do we want 10%? Do you know 4%? And how does this relate to stuff like the lottery ticket hypothesis, that there are particular structures of sparsity or density that are important? Yeah, um, so it's a good question. Um, I think, I think it has a lot to do with the network and, and the excess capacity. So what we've seen is that, you know, for ConfNets, um, you can usually you can usually get to fifty percent without losing anything, which is one of the reasons why the two to four is a great uh, great thing for compnets. Um, and you know, with some amount of effort, you can get to you know thirty percent and still be holding on to your accuracy. With compnets, if you go much below that, you, you lose a lot. Um, for for fully connected layers and 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 for things like the attention matrices in, in transformers, it can be quite a bit sparser than that. You can usually get down to close to ten percent before you see any any loss of accuracy. So there's a big gain there. Now, in terms of, of you know the lottery ticket hypothesis, I would need to think about that a little bit before I could give you. But I think there's a relationship there, and I just would need to think about what it is. Yeah. The left. Uh, thank you for coming, Professor Daly. Uh, Todd Besnick with Omnifidus. You, you had a slide up early and you mentioned Moore's Law and then you mentioned something like Wang's Law. What was that? 
Yeah, can I get my slides up here? Yeah, it, so... It's um, the top left corner of your final slide was very similar. Yeah, yeah, so if you can just pop one of my slides up here. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll just say what it is. So, you know, Moore's Law was that the, the performance of CPUs was, actually the original Moore's Law was that the cost of transistors, and it was about cost, it was an economic law, but the cost of transistors was being halved every year, and he later revised that every two years. Um, and then the popular version of Moore's Law was that the performance of CPUs was doubling every year. Um, Huang's Law um, ha has been that the, um, performance of, of GPUs uh, on deep learning is doubling every year, which, which of course gives us a thousand X in a decade, which is what we've seen going from Kepler to Hopper. Um, and and you know, part of the talk was sort of walking you through how we did that with number representation and complex instructions and sparsity. Hi, <clears throat> Hi Eric Mihiran, Qualcomm. So I heard uh, something contradictory to me in your, one of your talks. Uh, um, you, you made a point, it's the, the numbers are going to be roughly normal. The, the, high, the, the place where you want the most accuracy is, is around zero, right? But then forcing sparsity, that removes that accuracy, right? You're, you're pulling away from zero. And then the other one was the log format. The log format has a big quantization jump right around zero because you, you don't have yep. normals. So can you explain that? Yeah, no, it, 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 it is a little bad. So first of all, we, there, there are two halves of that question. So let me take the, uh, um, the sparsity half first. So it turns out that when you force sparsity, um, you get a different distribution. And I had a great slide that showed it. But somehow, in moving my slides from the Mac to the PC, it went away. But I encourage you to um, to, to look at our um, um, paper in, uh, I think it was ICLR in 2016, um, on deep compression, where we showed that when you, you know, prune the network um, and then retrain it, um, you forced certain numbers to be zero. And as a result, um, all of the other numbers kind of pull away from zero and you get a very low distribution of weights right around zero and instead you get these sort of two humps. It's like a normal distribution with the middle, mm -hmm. you know, cut out of it with like an almost an inverse normal distribution and, and, and that just naturally happens. So you don't need to represent those values um, right around zero when, when you are, are, are pruning. Now, the, the, the question about the log, uh, the log system is a good one. So it turns out um, all of these number representations, unless you have some way of doing denorms, have a big jump right at zero. And that hasn't seemed to hurt the accuracy, and I'm not exactly sure why, because that actually, you know, so the, so the worst case accuracy, if you take, you know, the, you know, the formula of what is the error divided by, you know, the number you're representing, for all of these formats is 100%, you know, from zero to where you, you start rounding up to one, or to sort of the first representable number, because you're basically, your error is your number until, until you get to that point. Uh, but that, it, so you can't compare the number systems on that because it's the same for all of them. Um, you could compare them all on what their smallest representable value is, and I think the, the, the log is no worse than, than the float on, on that. All right, thank you. Yeah. Take one off, Zach. Hi, this is from Reza Salajiani from UC Berkeley. Um, so I don't know if you saw some of the talks from yesterday, but yesterday um, they talked a little bit about how clipping out the dynamic range, clipping out those outliers, would really impact some of the language, large language models. And so the question is, um, have you, how important do you think it is to be able to keep those outliers in there for the accuracy of the model? What are some of the trade-offs of clipping out those far left and right values? Yeah, so that, that's a that's a great question. So, you know, we let me talk about two pieces of work. One of which I included here, and one of which I didn't mention. Um, so, what we found in the work on on magnet, magnetic BERT when we applied the octave, which is the optimum um, clipping algorithm to it, is that by doing optimum clipping, holding the precision constant, we improved the accuracy of the large language models because what we lost um, by clipping these outliers um, down. Is, um, was much more than compensated for by the reduced quantization error. Now that said, we've done some more recent work where what we've found is that in large language models, there are a small number of weights 
um, that are, you know, it's, it's kind of like Animal Farm where some weights are more equal than other weights. Um, and so there's a small number of weights in, in like, like, you know, single digit percentage that actually require higher precision than other weights do. And so some of these you need to take, if you're, if you're really, and this is another way that I think we're gonna be able to do more number representation. If you take some of these weights and really aggressively you know, quantize the ones that don't matter that much and then reserve some high precision and do mixed precision computation for the ones that really do, you can do a whole lot better. Okay, thank you. On the lines. Uh, Jenny, uh, Future Rate Technologies. Uh, first, thanks for the great insight uh, on hardware improvement for deep learning. Uh, I guess my question is more on the software side, uh, particularly software ecosystem. Um, people say hardware company success de eventually determines by the software. Here, uh, CUDA is definitely a great example. But going forward, how do you think of uh, uh, AMD's effort? Because they, they built, built both CPU and GPU. And how about Risk Five? Uh, a lot of companies, startups, they build accelerators and CPUs around it. And maybe uh, processing in memory, because memory capacity and the data movement is so important for deep learning, too. Thanks. Yeah, that's too many questions. I forgot what the first one was. Already. I know anything is uh, fine. Thank you. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff in there. I remember Risk Five. So uh, we like Risk Five. We actually are members of the Risk Five consortium. We use Risk Fives as little embedded processors in our systems all over the place. Uh, I'm trying to remember what some of the other questions were. Um, yeah. Doing a memory. Ask AMD. one question. Yeah. One question. <laughs> Combinations of CPUs and GPUs. I think. Yeah. yeah. Charlie? Yeah, I'm Charlie to Merchant Semi Accurate. Mm -hmm. um, NVIDIA started out making consumer GPUs. Then you came out with special drivers to make professional slash compute uh, cards. And then you went to blowing fuses. Then you went to bifurcating the hardware into consumer and professional lines. And the professional lines are more or less what we have for AI now. Do you see in the future the professional lines being, or the AI side of it, being bifurcated or whatever forcated into, I'm being intentionally vague here, different verticals for different types of AI? Um, so you know, part of what you asked me is a marketing question. I'm not a marketing no. person, so I can't answer that part. Um, I think we, we try to deliver products to people that meet the needs of given segments. And we already have two very distinct product lines, so we have you know, our, you know, I don't think we call it Tesla anymore, but essentially our data center line of, of GPUs like the H100 that go into the data center where people want to do AI on them. And then we have our embedded line um, of, of our Tegra parts like, you know, Orin and Thor and so on that are intended to go into things like self-driving vehicles and robots and stuff like that where the power is limited and you're not in a data center that has to stand on its, on its own. And so it has, you know, the you know, video processing for the camera and all that stuff uh, right on the same chip. And, and I think that you know, we will you know, constantly look at, at what the markets are. And if we ever saw that you know, the two pieces of the AI market were moving in very different directions in terms of what they needed, that might be some motivation um, to you know, you know, have different products trying to address those. But right now, you know, you know, what is in Hopper is what you need you know, across you know, the AI market from simple MLPs that people use to decide what ad you're seeing um, in your web browser to you know, large language models like GPT-4 to running ConvNets to, to, or, or visual transformers to do the best image recognition. All right, we'll take one last quick question on the left. Yeah, yeah this is Michael Lowry from NASA, uh, more in the context of computer vision, so your second product line. Mm -hmm. um, first thing is there's huge sparsity with respect to what you get frame to frame and how can you take advantage of that. Somewhat related to that, you mentioned reducing the swing. And if you're trying to uh, reduce the swing, are we looking towards sub-threshold or even bringing back analog? So sorry, two questions. Yeah, two questions, yeah. Everybody does that. And so <laughs> let, let, me, um, let me answer the first one. So um, it's a really good point about um, if you're processing a video, the way many of us process videos today, I think there's a huge opportunity here. Um, we actually treat it as a series of still images, and we apply the deep networks we've evolved for still images to look at it, and it's a huge waste because there's so much information that we should have gotten from the previous frame that we should be applying to the next frame. But we're kind of looking at it like we've never seen that before, and so um, I think that there's a huge opportunity there. We're not exploiting it yet, and I think that once we do, there'll be even larger gains in, in, in you know, video understanding, which is, by the way, what the self-driving cars deal with. And they're typically dealing with it as a single frame or maybe looking at a couple together, but not 
taking the whole video um, in context. And then the second one was, was, um, was about reduced swing. And so the one result we had, I think we had in um, ISSCC is around 2013 um, called um, uh, charge recycled signaling or something like that. And what we did is we split the power supply. So if you had like a you know, 0.8 volt power supply, we would signal 0.4 volts and we would have two rails. We would have signaling between zero and 0.4 and 0.4 and, and eight. And that wound up being four times more efficient because you know, it's CV squared um, you know, for, for the energy per signal swing. Um, Sub-threshold, you tend to lose more um, you, you tend to lose more in a couple ways. Um, you, you wind up with a you know, sort of a continuous, you know, most of the subthreshold logic families wind up dissipating continuous current. You can't make them really on off the way you make um, CMOS. It's like you're back to the old days of designing NMOS. That was you know, longer ago than I want to admit I was around. Um, and, um, and because it dissipates all the time, you, you wind up losing. You wind up losing more than you save by that. So typically when you're picking the optimum operating voltage, it's slightly above threshold voltage. You know, for the magnetic birth stuff, we're running, you know, we're Around 0.5 is a pretty good voltage if you want to reduce operating um, voltages. And I, I'm constantly intrigued by analog, so I keep hiring interns to work over the summer saying, I know we can make analog work um, because you know doing the multiply add an analog, it costs you almost nothing. But the problem is that's not the whole system. And, and so some, you usually wind up having to do a data conversion somewhere to store the number or move it somewhere else. And once you do that, you've lost. I mean, once you do that, you're going to do no better than um, you know, kind of five teraops per watt, and that doesn't compete with 100 teraops per watt you can do digitally. So I haven't seen an analog um, approach that is at all energy competitive with digital yet, and I keep hiring interns and setting them loose on and figuring one of them is gonna have a great idea and crack the problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Yeah.